position to talk to the uh, SciStar Society. Um, from my own personal point of view, it's wonderful, I should say, to, to see it actually carrying on during these weird times that we're, we're living in. Um, uh, you know, I think the, the Physics Society is very good at getting people from different years together to chat together and, and getting, you know, it's what a university should be about, which is uh, everyone, students and staff, engaging together and, and talking about physics and about research. So yes, the title I've chosen, which actually, well, I, I didn't choose, I guess, I guess Luke did and asked me to speak about, uh, is I'm going to tell you about something called the double copy, uh, which is, as we'll see, a relationship between very different theories of physics. Uh, so I'll talk about what those theories are and, and what that relation means. Uh, but basically, it's giving us a new way to think about gravity. Uh, now, this is something that I've spent a lot of time researching in the last few years, since about 2014 or so. And there's many other people at Queen Mary working on this, uh, as, as we'll see. So do feel free to ask questions as we go through in the chat window or something. Um, and then also at the end, we'll have a question and answer session as well. So let me start by giving a, an outline uh, of the talk. Um, so I'll, I'll remind people or tell them for the first time if they don't know about the four fundamental forces in nature. Uh, there's something called the strong force in nature, which holds nuclei together. That is described by a theory called quantum chromodynamics, which is a very fancy name. And I'll try and explain the basic ideas of that theory uh, in the first part of the talk. Uh, we're going to see a relationship between theories like QCD uh, and uh, theories uh, of gravity. So general relativity is one such theory of gravity, uh, but there are others that we could write down as well. Uh, and then I'll talk about this thing called the double copy, which is really the kind of combination of, of, of QCD and gravity in that this relationship tells us we can take results from the theory of the strong force and convert them into gravity results. And it's that aspect that sort of gives us a new way uh, to think about gravity. One of the main applications of this that's getting a lot of attention at the moment is in gravitational waves. So I'll say a bit about that. But because this is a talk where I'm hopefully trying to inspire you, <laughs> hopefully it's succeeding in that, uh, I'll conclude with some open questions uh, of things that I'd certainly like to think about. Uh, and, you know, there may be things that, that you, you go on to think about in your own careers as well. So, yes, uh, let me start then by talking about um, particle physics in, in, in general. So my training as a scientist is, is in particle physics. Uh, why did I choose particle physics? Um, that's because it addresses what I think are the most profound questions faced by, by humankind. Uh, you know, what is the universe? Where did it come from? How will it end? Um, all those kind of big questions that, that, that humans have wanted to know the answers to for, for many thousands of years. Now, of course, particle physics does not sit alone by itself. Uh, there is a clear overlap between particle physics and also cosmology and astrophysics. Uh, now, you know, say 150 years ago, so that, that would have been true. Uh, particle physics addresses the very small things in nature. Astronomy looks at the very big things, and cosmology is the, is the study of, of the biggest thing, which is the whole universe all at once. Um, but what we now know, of course, is that the, um, or, you know, we think very strongly, the universe expanded outwards from a big bang at some finite time in the past. Uh, and so if you run the clock backwards, uh, then obviously the universe gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the energies get hotter and hotter and hotter, uh, and then the types of processes that go on in the early universe are particle physics processes that we're still trying to understand today. So, you know, that's what we try and do in particle accelerators, roughly speaking, is recreate these conditions in the early universe. Now, our current best theory of particle physics is the standard model of particle physics. Uh, so there are these four fundamental forces in, in nature, the electromagnetic force, um, the strong and the weak nuclear forces. So one of those holds the nuclei together. Uh, the other one is involved in, in various nuclear decay processes. Um, and uh, yeah, so together those make three of these four fundamental forces in nature. Uh, and those are described by the standard model of particle physics. So it's an example of something called a quantum field theory. So I'll try and convey to you what the basic idea of a, of a quantum field theory is. But basically it is the type of theory that includes all the physics you know about. <laughs> if you sort of gradually unify it all together, you end up with a quantum field theory. Uh, and its, it's description of, of nature at its kind of most basic is that there are fundamental particles in nature and there are forces that, 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 that act on those, um, on those matter particles. So, um, you know, I've stolen this plot from Google or something, and these are the fundamental particles that are in the standard model. There are things called quarks, which sit inside the proton, and indeed particles like the proton. Uh, there are the electrons and, and related partners of those. Um, there are things called neutrinos and, 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 and so on. Then these particles on the right are the particles that carry the, the, the forces in nature. And if we put those all together, we sort of get the standard model of particle physics. So it's a detailed set of equations that tells us how to calculate how those um, particles behave. Now, the fourth fundamental force that I have not talked about here is uh, gravity. Uh, gravity, as 
many will know uh, and in this uh, audience is described by general relativity. So that is the current best or most complete theory of gravity that we have. Uh, and that is famously not a quantum theory. Um, it is a purely classical theory, um, but there are reasons to expect that gravity should become quantum. Uh, first of all, of course, there's the aesthetic reason that all of the other forces include the effects of quantum mechanics. Uh, so why shouldn't gravity be quantum? Uh, the other thing is that there are uh, places in the universe where gravity, meaning classical general relativity, actually breaks down. So if you look in the center of a black hole, for example, classical general relativity fails to make sense. It sort of just breaks. Also, at the Big Bang itself, um, general relativity is not enough to explain what, what, what happens there. Uh, so, you know, that's a reason to expect that quantum effects may resolve those those issues. Uh, and then finally, there are kind of incomplete insights that suggest that quantum gravity is there uh, and has some effects. So one of the most famous of those probably is by Stephen Hawking that said that black holes are not actually completely black. They don't absorb all radiation. They actually radiate a little bit. Uh, and that is a, um, a kind of tantalizing glimpse of a quantum effect <laughs> that, that, that might be there that is not quite quite fully understood. Uh, now, I would say the situation in quantum gravity, and it's been like this for my whole lifetime, actually, uh, but it's a bit like quantum electromagnetism was in the 1930s. So in the 1930s, they had a quantum theory of the electron. They didn't really have a full quantum field theory of the electromagnetic field, uh, uh, but there were various hints about what that should look like. And what was very helpful at that point in history is that they could actually do the experiments that guided them towards the correct theory of, of quantum electromagnetism. And then the theories for the other forces followed uh, in, in the decades after that. So we're kind of like that situation now where we have glimpses of quantum gravity, but we don't quite fully understand it. However, it's much, much harder to test quantum gravity in, in experiments. Uh, so one of the things that can help is just find very novel ways of, of testing quantum gravity. And uh, cosmology is, is, is offers some possibilities, actually. Uh, another thing is that you can just look for new ways of thinking about gravity uh, and then use those new theoretical ideas to actually tell you more results than you had before or give you new insights into what the theory uh, uh, has to look like. Uh, now, recent research suggests that progress can indeed be made by looking at a completely different theory, uh, which is the uh, theory of the strong force. So yes, what is the strong force? Well, protons consist of smaller particles called quarks, uh, and those are bound together uh, by, by the strong force. Uh, now you can see that there must be a very strong force that's stronger than electromagnetism to hold nuclei together, uh, because nuclei consist of protons and neutrons. Uh, the protons are positively charged, and so electromagnetism wants to make them repel each other. Uh, so there must be an even stronger force that pulls everything together, uh, and that is the, the nuclear strong force. Now, it is described by part of the standard model, and it turns out to be a bit of the standard model that uh, you can actually kind of take away and study by itself, uh, and it's called quantum chromodynamics. And this picture here is of three people um, that won the Nobel Prize in relatively recently, I think, in the mid noughties um, for basically showing that quantum chromodynamics was the, the correct theory. I and mean, they actually got that Nobel Prize for a certain calculation. And the only thing that mattered was that the, the, the sign of the calculation was negative. <laughs> so it's it's still the only Nobel Prize I know about that is, was essentially given for a minus sign. But anyway, it's by now well established that the theory of the the, uh, the strong force is this quantum chromodynamics. Uh, now, I'm already looking at this picture because it seems if you're a bloke that works on quantum chromodynamics, you are very likely to lose your hair at a very early age. <laughs> and indeed, I'm starting to suffer, as you can see, from the, uh, the curse of quantum chromodynamics, I think, uh, myself. It's certainly a theory that makes you tear your hair out. It's a very difficult uh, theory. So anyway, yes, recently, a very intriguing relationship has been found, uh, which is called the double copy between this theory that we understand very well and potentially quantum gravity that we don't understand uh, on the other hand. So to tell you more about that, I have to look at each theory in detail and tell you about the kinds of things we, we calculate in the theories. Uh, so what's the best way to think about quantum chromodynamics? Well, we can regard it in a very well-defined sense, which I won't fully go into, uh, as being a generalization of electromagnetism. Uh, now, most of you will have seen the theory of electromagnetism before. Uh, my students that are in the first year are just starting to see the full theory of electromagnetism. So they actually saw Maxwell's equations this morning in what we call their global or integral form. Uh, they've yet to see them in, in, in this form here. But I'll talk through these equations if, if you haven't seen them before. Uh, basically, what we find in electromagnetism is that there are two kinds of field in nature describing electric and magnetic forces. So the electric and the magnetic fields, and that they're basically generated by charged particles. Uh, so, you know, this is to represent the charge density in space. This is the current density. Uh, and, you know, these equations literally say 
charges cause electric fields, moving charges cause magnetic and electric fields, and then the various fields mix up uh, uh, in other ways. Um, so yeah, that's basically uh, Maxwell's equations. Now the way that we think about them in particle physics is a little bit different. So let me just uh, close my email so it stops beeping. Um, yeah, the way we think about them as in particle physics is, is rather different. Um, that form of the Maxwell equations there doesn't quite have the um, theory of relativity built into it, um, meaning that if I were to do a Lorentz transformation, I would actually mix up the electric and magnetic fields in a way that makes those equations not the most convenient to use if we want to bring relativity into the game. Now, you would want to do that in particle physics, because if you have particles moving very fast, then they're going to have relativistic uh, uh, effects and so on. So we have a language for electromagnetism, which actually uh, is a kind of the correct language to use um, if things are moving very fast, uh, and it involves things called four vectors. So what's the basic idea? Well, in special relativity, space and time, uh, as you all know, are not independent, but they mix up with each other under uh, what we call the red transformations. So those are the transformations that take you between coordinate systems that are moving at different fixed speeds. Uh, that also means that electric and magnetic fields mix up with each other. So it's interesting to ask, well, can you have a single object that somehow includes the effect of both of them in one object so that things look a little bit more convenient? So for space and time, you can certainly do that. And there are things called four vectors, uh, where you basically take the speed of light times the time component, uh, and then the x, y, and z coordinates, and you make a single four component object, uh, which for obvious reasons is called a four vector. Uh, and where the index mu there tells you which component uh, you're, you're talking about. Uh, now, likewise, you can combine electric and magnetic fields into a, a, a single four vector. Uh, and the way to do that is to first introduce the electrostatic potential, um, which uh, I mean, you, you, you may well have seen before. There's also something called the magnetic vector potential. And it turns out when you introduce these things that you can basically rewrite the electric and magnetic fields in terms of a scalar called the electrostatic potential and uh, this vector uh, called the magnetic vector potential. So again, don't worry if you haven't seen these things before. There are just some quantities that you can use to rewrite the, the electromagnetic fields. Now, why would you want to do that? Uh, well, it turns out that if you take those two quantities and put them into a kind of four component object like this, that thing is also a four vector, meaning that it happens to transform nicely under Lorentz transformations. So the, there is a whole relativistic language of writing the equations of electromagnetism that is in terms of this thing uh, rather than the separate electric and magnetic fields. So that is usually just called the gauge field uh, for weird historical reasons. We can also call it the photon field uh, for things uh, for, for reasons that hopefully will become clear. But basically, all of Maxwell's equations that you may know about in, in another language can basically be rewritten uh, in terms of this uh, gauge field. Uh, and that is the, the language, as I say, that, that is used in, in particle physics. So let me show you one of those equations or, or a combination of them. It turns out under certain conditions uh, that you can show that this equation is true. Uh, so basically, you have two time derivatives on the left hand side. Uh, and you have two space derivatives in each term on, on the right hand side. And as you may or may not know, every time you have an equation like that in physics, the solutions of it are waves. So this is called the wave equation. And what this basically says is there are certain solutions of electromagnetism um, that are uh, waves. So we call them electromagnetic waves. And that's, you know, light rays and uh, uh, infrared and radio waves and so on. So the whole electromagnetic spectrum arises as solutions of this wave equation of uh, electromagnetism. So that's basically everything I've talked about there has been uh, classical. Um, how do you go to the quantum theory of electromagnetism? Well, you kind of already know the answer uh, from the courses that, that you've done, I think. Uh, in classical electromagnetism, these wave-like solutions can have any energy. Um, so we can either think of the energy or the frequency because they're, they're, they're related. Uh, but basically, the um, energy is a kind of continuous variable that can take any value. Uh, but in the quantum theory, that's, that's not really true. Uh, waves arrive as little lumps or quanta, um, which have a name in the case of electromagnetism, we, we call them photons. Uh, so what photons are, are just quanta of wave-like solutions of the equations defining uh, uh, the theory. So let's recap that again. Whenever we have some kind of field filling all space, so in this case this A mu field that represents both electricity and magnetism, there will be some equations describing how that field behaves, which in this case are Maxwell's equations. Um, usually those equations have some wave-like solutions uh, and then individual quanta or lumps of, of those wave-like solutions are what we mean by, by particles. 
so you've seen that in the case of electromagnetism. What you may not realize is that that is true indeed for all the forces in nature and indeed all the matter particles as well. So what the standard model is, is it's a field theory where there, there are fields for each type of particle. There's an electron field, there are quark fields, there's a muon field and so on. There are fields for each kind of force carrying particle. So there's a photon field, which is the one we've just seen. There's a, a what we call a gluon field for the strong force and, uh, and so on. Uh, there's a set of equations describing how those fields behave. In every case, those equations have wave-like solutions. And then what we mean by the particles of the standard model are just quanta of those wave-like solutions of, 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 of the fields. Uh, so um, that is the basic idea of, of what a quantum field theory is. And that's quite profound in a way because all of the particles in nature, as far as we are aware, in other words, the stuff we are made of, <laughs> me sat here literally talking to you now, <laughs> the, the, the stuff I'm made of is these little excitations of wave-like solutions of fields uh, uh, that are filling all of space. So it's really a very um, uh, different way of thinking to when we first start learning physics when, when we're very young, but it is to the best of our knowledge how, how, how the universe actually works. Uh, now those of you that go on to learn quantum field theory, so it's a course that's usually offered in the, in the fourth year, um, there will be an awful lot of algebra that you will see and you will be mesmerized and or horrified by it uh, but behind it all is actually this very simple idea so try and keep this idea in your heads as you go on to study quantum field theory uh, and it may help you decode all that difficult stuff uh, that's that's uh, going on when you have to learn the theory properly and of course you know you're always welcome to ask any of us questions about um, uh, uh, problems that you may encounter in your studies so yes anyway that was the um, theory of electromagnetism and that it is a quantum field theory um, that means then that the, the language of fields that we set up for electromagnetism, something like that will also be applying for quantum chromodynamics. Uh, there are some differences, though. And in particular, quarks carry a type of charge, uh, which is called colour. So this is nothing to do with electromagnetic charge and it's nothing to do with visible colours. Uh, it's just you know, this is a historic name for what people call this, this type of charge. And unlike electromagnetic charge, which can come in positive or negative types, it turns out that color charge can come in three types, which are just given the labels red, green, and blue. Um, again, sort of historically for whoever named the, the, the theory. Now that's why it's called chromodynamics because chromo is the, is the Greek for color. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's where the, the name came from. However, just like in QED, uh, in quantum electrodynamics, a charged particle will create an electromagnetic field. Uh, the color charge in this case will create its own gauge field. Uh, and that field will have particles or quanta associated with it uh, and in this case those are called gluons uh, and that name really did come from the fact that people say well they glue the proton together <laughs> so that's why we'll call these things uh, gluons. Now a bit of a difference to electromagnetism is that if a quark is moving along let's say we have a red quark moving along it can change its color charge by emitting a gluon and that's very different to, to in electrodynamics because an electron for example can't change its charge uh, by emitting a photon. So the photon doesn't carry any charge. In quantum chromodynamics, uh, this red charge must go somewhere if charge is conserved, and this green charge must have appeared from somewhere. So what we can see is that the gluon itself must be carrying uh, a color charge and sort of a weird pair of charges um, uh, uh, in this way. Uh, and the fact that gluons themselves carry color charge actually makes the theory much richer and more complicated than the theory of electromagnetism. So yes, the fact that gluons carry colour means that QCD is much more complicated than QED, meaning electrodynamics. Uh, and in particular, the gluon can interact with itself. So, you know, if it had a gluon moving along, it could sort of split into other gluons. It also turns out that it can emit a pair of gluons uh, uh, like this. Now, naively, you might expect that there are nine types of gluon because you can have any type of colour charge. And if the arrow is going the other way, we call that an anti-colour charge. So you would think you have three choices here and three, and that's nine. But it turns out for a technical reason of the theory that there's only eight of them. Uh, so we basically have a field for the for the for the gluon, uh, which now has a little extra index on it that tells us what kind of gluon we're, we're talking about. So we can either think of that as eight different fields or as one gluon field, but with an index uh, that, that, that tells us kind of what type of gluon we're, we're talking about. Uh, now, it turns out for what I'm going to tell you that we don't have to consider the full theory of QCD with the quarks in. We can just talk about gluons by themselves. That is a non-trivial theory because gluons can interact with other gluons, so a lot can happen in that theory. And that theory has a name. It is called pure gauge theory, or also Yang-Mills theory, after the people that, that discovered it. So that's a little bit about the theory of the strong force and the Yang-Mills theory and QCD and, and things like that. I want to talk about a relationship between that theory and gravity. 
Um, so first of all, I have to tell you a bit more about gravity and what our best theory of that is. Uh, so as I already said, our best theory of gravity is Einstein's general theory of relativity, uh, which is now over 100 years old. So we tend to think of this as modern newfangled physics, just because it's weird, and it is very weird. Um, but it is actually quite old now uh, in terms of its age. Um, now, the basic idea of general relativity is that matter and energy curve the space around them. Uh, and to see why that might represent the force of gravity, if you have a curved space, so imagine I've got this sphere here and I've got two dimensional beings or ants or something on the sphere. Let's say that I told two ants to walk towards this bit of the sphere, even though locally they think they're going in a straight line, they would end up kind of moving towards each other and meeting at this point here. So it kind of looks like there's uh, an attractive force between them. Now, that is a rather flawed analogy in, in, in many ways, but the basic idea is correct, that in general relativity, um, objects curve the space around them. And if you're moving in a curved space, you won't follow a, a straight line path, you'll follow a, a curved one. And it turns out that that has the right properties to be uh, the attractive force of, of gravity. Now, mathematically, how do you actually describe gravity uh, in, in general relativity? Now, of course, some people have studied this uh, and some not. So it's a course that's that's offered in, in the third year, I think, uh, for the first time. Uh, but we can describe the structure of space and time using something called a metric tensor. So imagine that I have just a, a three dimensional example and that I have the normal X, Y and Z axes of space. Uh, and then imagine that I, I had a little displacement. So I started at one point in space and I went a little way to another point in space here. Um, that little displacement there, if I resolved it into components, would have an X component, some little change in X dx, a Y component dy, and a Z component dz. And I know just from Pythagoras's theorem that, that uh, the length of that little infinitesimal arrow is just going to be one displacement squared plus the other one squared plus the other one squared, where what matters is that they're all orthogonal to each other uh, and, and so on. Now, I don't normally bother doing this for Pythagoras's theorem, but if I really wanted to, uh, I could write that in a very cumbersome way. <laughs> I could have the vector dx, dy, dz, which indeed is the vector that, that, that points along that, that displacement. Uh, and then I could have it again over here. And I could say that I have a matrix in between, um, which actually in this case is just the identity matrix, because the identity matrix acting on that will just give the same vector back. Uh, and then if I multiply that out, I'll get dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. Um, so let's think about that. So, you know, this is a very trivial example, and I don't need to do this. But let's see what's happening there. What this thing defines for me is how distances are defined in the space. If I want to know what the distance is between two points, I want to know how far have I gone in certain coordinate axes, then add them all together. And the rule for doing that is encoded by this matrix here. Now, here we have a simple case of, of a flat space. Uh, if I had a curved space, the way that would be described is that I would replace this, this matrix with something else. If I had a more non-trivial matrix here that changed as I went throughout the space, that would tell me that the way distances are behaving is different at different points in the space. Uh, and that is exactly what a curved space is. It warps and stretches and does funny things. So the distance uh, and the way we define distance is changing at, at, at different points in the space. So you know, by setting up a language like this for relativity, I will get something that describes how space and time is, 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 is curved. So that's exactly what's done. So in a curved space, this metric tensor will depend on the position. Uh, also, working in three dimensions, as we did there, is not enough, because we know that in relativity, we have to combine space and time into, into one kind of thing. So we have four vectors which combine space and time. So I have a four dimensional space time, uh, and that means I can write a metric tensor now for space time rather than just for space. So I've written this not as a matrix equation now, but as a um, uh, what we call an index equation where I'm summing over indices. But basically, this is telling me that if I have two events in space time and I go some little time interval, some little distance interval uh, between those 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 two events, I have some matrix that if I sum over the two vectors uh, with that matrix in between tells me how the distances are defined in space time. Uh, so basically, then what Einstein's equations of general relativity do is they give you an equation that says how that metric tensor depends on the matter and energy that is uh, in, in the space time. So I'm not actually going to write the equations here because they're, they're rather complicated, but there's some mathematical matrix that describes how space and, uh, sorry, how um, energy and matter are, are kind of distributed throughout the space time. Uh, and there's a, a, an equation 
that says in principle you can work out what the metric tensor is of space time if you know the energy and the matter distribution. So in other words, you know the curvature of space based on the matter that is in it. And that makes mathematically precise that idea that matter curves space. And that's where, where gravity comes from. Um, so you end up with quite a remarkable thing. If you solve Einstein's equations of general relativity, you in principle get a solution for what the, the, the universe looks like all at once. Uh, that's the, the cosmology, the study of the universe. That's, that's where that field actually comes from. We're able to solve for certain solutions uh, for how the universe will behave. Uh, solutions include, for example, the Big Bang. That's where it comes from. It is a solution of the equations of, of general relativity. And the metric tensor in that case describes the system that is gradually stretching outwards so that distances are, are kind of redefined at each point in time. Uh, other solutions would describe more kind of local objects. Uh, things like black holes come out as solutions of general relativity uh, uh, and so on. Now, there are other interesting consequences of general relativity. Uh, so first of all, uh, what happens if there's no gravity there? Uh, well, that means that the metric of space time that you get is just the usual flat space metric uh, that we would use in special relativity to take dot products of, of, of four vectors. Uh, so um, then what we would do is usually write the full metric, if there is gravity, as the flat space metric, which is normally written eta for some reason, um, and then plus something called h, where that h represents the deviation from empty space or just from, from, from flat space. Now, why have I bothered introducing that? Uh, well, it turns out, um, that if you substitute that into the Einstein equations and you ask what happens, at, at, at least approximately, you get this equation here. So what you find is that uh, this uh, H object, this field uh, uh, sitting everywhere in space time, obeys the wave equation uh, exactly in the same way uh, that this A mu field, which represented electromagnetism, obeyed that equation before. So we know what this solution is. Uh, it's the wave equation. And you may then ask, well, what is the meaning of solutions of uh, of wave solutions of general relativity, uh, well, given that that metric represents how space time kind of moves and walks and, and, and stretches, these wave solutions are little ripples in the fabric of space time itself. So general relativity really is quite remarkable in the revolution in our thinking it gives us for how we think about space and time. We used to think that space and time were just kind of passive things. That you know, well, the way I like to think about it is. Imagine you had like a theatre and you've got a stage and you put some actors on it uh, and you could take them to a different theatre and put them on a different stage and they they'd kind of do the same thing. And, and the nature of the stage, which is the space time bit, doesn't doesn't really matter. Uh, and the actors are kind of representing the, the, the matter particles that are living in the space time. Um, what general relativity says is that kind of the stage itself is dynamical and it moves and walks about in response to how the actors are, are, are walking about on it. And then if you think of that stage as kind of having little ripples in it, those would be the gravitational waves that those actors would be would be giving off. I'm sure that's a rather ham-fisted analogy, um, but uh, anyway, it, it clarifies my thinking um, uh, somehow. So yes, these wave-like solutions for H are gravitational waves, and they represent little ripples in the fabric of space-time. Um, until recently, these were thought to be purely theoretical things. I mean, people kind of believed they were there, uh, but no one had ever seen them. Um, they were recently discovered, very, very recently, uh, only a couple of years ago, by the LIGO experiment in the States. They are phenomenally difficult things to measure, these gravitational waves. So it's an incredible achievement, even that they managed to see these things. Um, but what we certainly hope is that this will open up an entirely new era in observational astronomy. There are objects in the universe, very heavy objects, that we don't see directly from visible light or from any other kind of radiation. Black holes would be an example of that. However, they would give off gravitational waves. So by being able to measure gravitational waves, we get a huge amount more information about the most misunderstood and poorly understood objects in the universe, uh, things like black holes. So it's a massive leap forward, I think, in what humankind is able to understand about the universe uh, that we live in. Uh, so yeah, that's generated massive amounts of excitement, and I'll talk more about gravitational waves later. Um, but how does this relate to the kind of quantum field theory stuff I was, I was talking about before? Uh, well, in quantum gravity, you would expect those waves to arrive in discrete quanta, uh, and those will be called gravitons. So when we talk about a potential quantum theory of gravity, when I say graviton, I kind of mean the gravity analog of the photon in electromagnetism. Now, what I'm going to hopefully try and convince you of is that how gravitons behave turns out to be very similar, actually, to how uh, gluons and, and, and photons behave. Well, how do we know how particles behave? Well, what we typically do in any quantum field theory is that we throw some particles together and we see how they scatter with each other. 
Uh, and then we go and measure in experiments how they scatter with each other. Uh, and that's how we test our theories of particle physics. So a typical situation in, in quantum field theory is that we have some particles scattering into other particles. Uh, what kind of calculations do we do to work out what will happen? Well, of course, in a quantum theory, uh, we don't know exactly what will happen, but we can calculate probabilities for things to happen. So the, the, the things that physicists like me actually calculate to give to experimentalists in, in particle accelerator experiments are basically, you know, here is some distribution or probability distribution of something that you should go and look for, where in principle you can calculate that from uh, from the quantum field theory that you that you uh, uh, want to study. Uh, so um, the probability in any of these scattering processes turns out to be related to something called the scattering amplitude. So some of you may have seen in your quantum courses that if you have some state, some quantum state, so you might have some state representing all these outgoing particles. Uh, if that's related to some other state, which in this case would be the incoming particles, uh, then there's some overlap of those states that you can take uh, where that is called an amplitude. And the probability to go from one state to the other one, in other words, from the incoming state to the outgoing one, is related to the uh, magnitude of the amplitude squared. So even if you haven't seen that before, just rest assured that there is some number that you can calculate in quantum field theory, uh, which is related to probabilities that you can go away and, and, and actually measure. Uh, about how particles behave. So a lot of what theoretical particle physicists actually do is try and calculate these scattering amplitudes and find clever ways of, of thinking about them. Well, one of the traditional ways to think about scattering amplitudes is using things called Feynman diagrams. So imagine I've got some gluons interacting and I draw a kind of rough space-time picture of what happens. Let's say that as I go along in time, some gluons come together, they exchange another gluon, and then the momenta of each gluon might change. So, you know, this represents some scattering process of gluons coming in, something happening, and then they scatter off again. Uh, so these Feynman diagrams, as we call them, offer a useful visualization for how the interaction actually happens. But they turn out to be much more than that. Uh, and those of you that learn quantum field theory in your later years will see that there's a, a set of very precise mathematical rules called Feynman rules that convert any such diagram into actual algebra for the scattering amplitude. So it's not the only way that we know about nowadays, but, but one way to calculate scattering amplitudes uh, is to draw all the possible Feynman diagrams for the process that you're talking about, namely what particles are coming in, which ones are going out, convert each diagram using the Feynman rules into algebra for the scattering amplitude, add it all together, uh, and then you get a formula for the scattering amplitude that you can use to you know, calculate observable things that experimentalists would, would go and measure. Now, what do those Feynman rules look like? Well, I'll just I don't expect you to understand them uh, because the notation's a bit, a bit weird, but I just want to show you that they're very different for different theories. So if we look at them in QCD, one of the things that can happen is that a gluon can interact with a pair of other gluons, and we saw this earlier on. So the Feynman rules will include what we call a vertex for three gluons in interacting, and then I can use that to build more complicated diagrams like the one here, which involves two, uh, three little vertices. And I've just shown you the formula here uh, for comparison with, with gravity in a minute. So this is a, is a number, it's something called the, the strong coupling constant. So it's a number that represents the strength of this force or the strength of this coupling. Uh, and then there are various, you know, momenta of the particles and things like this, uh, and we don't have to go into it. Uh, so this looks pretty complicated, uh, but it's not too complicated. And even if you don't know what the symbols mean, you would say, well, how many terms are there in this expression? Six. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's you know, a complicated thing to look at, but it's only got six terms in it. So, you know, chances are I could go away and calculate with that. And indeed, you know, in a, even in a master's course in um, uh, uh, quantum field theory, you can do calculations involving this. You know, you can do them with pen and paper, and you don't need big computers to do it. Uh, so we could also ask them, well, in gravity, what happens if you have three gravitons? Uh, well, it's completely horrible. <laughs> so I've just uh, nicked this from some research paper. I can't remember which one. Uh, and this is the vertex in some notation uh, that even I can't remember what it means uh, for what the rule looks like for three gravitons meeting at a point. Um, and yeah, the authors have actually used a rather clever notation to condense the terms so that I can actually fit it on one slide. But actually, there's a, if you expand it out, there's 171 individual terms uh, that describe how, how gravitons uh, are coupled together. So the, literally the only thing I want you to appreciate here is that using traditional methods to calculate how scattering would work, gravity looks completely different to the theory of the strong force. Uh, and it is not at all clear that there should be any kind of relationship between them. Uh, now, the other thing, uh, point we can take from this, is that indeed this is horrible. Uh, and that tells you that by calculating by hand with pen and paper, calculations in quantum gravity um, are 
essentially impossible after a point. What's amazing is some of the foundational work in the 60s that was done, people didn't have computers and they did do these calculations by hand. I've got you know, an enormous amount of respect for those people. Uh, but it really has been true that progress in quantum gravity for decades has been held up by the fact we simply can't even do the calculations. They get too complicated. And even when you bring computers or supercomputers or clusters of computers into the game, we still can't quite quite do the calculations. So, you know, what we need is new methods for crunching this phenomenal algebra uh, to, to, to get uh, answers for what things in quantum gravity uh, could look like. However, let's imagine that you did this. Let's imagine that you took a particular scattering amplitude. So you had some, say, two gluons coming in, three gluons going out, and then you did the same in the gravity theory. So two you know, gravitons, three, three gravitons. Uh, and you said, let me um, calculate the scattering amplitude for that process to happen, and let me do it in QCD, and let me do it in gravity, and compare the results. Uh, it turns out that when you do all this massively complicated stuff, and you put the results together in the right way, you get formulae that look almost identical. Now, I've quoted these formally from recent research papers, so I'm not going to explain all the symbols and what they mean. However, I think it is more useful if you actually don't understand what the symbols mean, because you see that these formulae are almost identical. Um, the only thing that changes is there's a, a number in the QCD amplitude that represents the strength of the force, and that gets replaced in gravity with a different number, which is related to Newton's constant, which is uh, the strength of the gravitational force. This thing here is a sum over all possible diagrams. Um, which we expect to be there. Uh, the other thing that I want to draw attention to is that in uh, when you have gluons interacting, because they carry a colour charge, there will be a part of each diagram that depends on the colour charges of the particles. So we call that the colour factor of each diagram, and that can be different for each different diagram. Uh, and then there's another thing uh, that then represents, or sorry, is um, sensitive to the information in the gluons that is not the colour charge. So, you know, gluons can be carrying a momentum. They could also be having a certain polarisation, uh, which, you know, um, um, photons, for example, can have, so gluons can certainly have. So this is a part of the amplitude, or each diagram in the amplitude, that depends on what we call the kinematic degrees of freedom of the gluons, so their momentum and their polarisations and so on. Um, however, all the other parts of the, of the formula are the same. So what this says is that if I hadn't known about Feynman rules, and if I for gravity and, and all that complication, I could have just taken a scattering amplitude in QCD, replaced the strength of the force with the gravity strength of the force, stripped off the colour factors, and replaced them with a second set of kinematic factors. And if I'd done that, I would have automatically got a scattering amplitude in gravity. Now that is incredibly remarkable. Uh, I found this amazing when I first saw this. The paper on this was 2012, so um, not, not even 10 years ago. Um, and I, I just found this amazing because what I knew about quantum gravity is that it looked like this. <laughs> Not that it looked in some weird way like two copies of this, which is a lot simpler. So this thing, uh, this relationship is called the double copy uh, for scattering amplitudes because it really does involve taking two copies of this particular bit of information in the uh, in the Gage theory or the, or the, the Yang-Mills theory uh, and kind of having two copies of that to make a gravity amplitude, but kind of leaving the rest of the formula uh, 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 the same. Now, of course, that suggests that there's some very profound link uh, between gauge theories, things like QCD and uh, uh, gravity theories. Uh, and that you know, has been a subject of very intense research since about 10 years ago when this paper first appeared. So, yes, uh, there's something else called the zeroth copy that I can also tell you about. So in the double copy, what we've just seen is that you replace the colour information that's in the gluon amplitude with extra kinematic information, and that gives you gravity amplitude. Uh, you could say, well, I could also do the opposite, could I not? I could take uh, the kinematic information away here and put a second lot of colour information in. Would that give me a scattering amplitude? And if so, what theory would it be in? It turns out, yes, it is an amplitude, and it's an amplitude in some weird theory called a biadjoint scalar theory. Um, and that process, instead of being called the double copy, is called the zeroth copy, because that's what the authors of the paper called it. Now, that biadjoint scalar theory, we've only known about then really for, for, for the last 10 years or so. It's not a physical theory by itself. We know that. Uh, I think there's, we can confidently say there's no physical system in nature that's described by that theory. However, it weirdly keeps popping up in lots of different contexts in the contemporary research literature on scattering amplitudes. Um, so even though that theory is not physical by itself, bits of that theory end up here in QCD and here in gravity. So the theories of nature that we do know about, electromagnetism and gravity, which is certainly the hair, they're inheriting at least some of their properties from this weird biadjoint scalar theory. So one of the 
subjects of research in recent years has just been what the hell is this theory <laughs> can we find out more about it because it might be giving us secret hints of what's sitting in behind gravity and, 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 and gaze theory so yes let me summarize everything i've said uh, so far in, in, in slightly easier terms um, we have what I've called here a trinity of theories. I, I gave a version of this talk at Trinity College Dublin recently, so you could see what I was doing with the, with the title of this slide. But anyway, we have a trinity of theories, which is a fancy way of saying it. Uh, we have gauge theory, which means things like electromagnetism or the theory of gluons. Uh, we have gravity, uh, which is general relativity and theories like it. And there's a relationship between scattering amplitudes that says if I take an amplitude in this theory, I can tweak it uh, and then I get a gravity amplitude. And the opposite of that procedure is called the single copy for, for obvious reasons. There is a zeroth copy that takes me from that theory to this weird bijectric scalar theory. Uh, and then I will just call that the inverse zeroth copy, which is a nice name one of my project students came up with once because no one had really named this thing in the, uh, uh, in the literature. So yes, scattering amplitudes in these different theories are related by mysterious relationships. To my mind, that strongly suggests that there's a very deep relation between these completely different physical theories. And what it strongly suggests to me is that our traditional way of thinking about field theory is in some sense wrong if you want to show up that actually very different physical theories actually look the same as each other if you think about them in the right way. It suggests that there's a hidden language for, for all of quantum field theory that makes these structures manifest rather than us having to take decades to, to, to work out that they're there. So what's happening a lot in, at the moment in current research in, in, in theoretical physics is that people are rewriting quantum field theory in, in often very weird ways that makes these very odd and intriguing relationships um, um, show up more, more clearly. Now, the other thing um, I'd like to know is, I mean, it could just be that that lot of relationships there is only true for scattering amplitudes. And if so, that's fine. It's a nice way to, to get practical results for scattering amplitudes in different theories. Um, but it, you know, it would be nice if it was more than that. It would be nice if it somehow worked for the whole theories themselves, whatever that means. So, you know, um, can we take any object in this theory and turn it into an object in, in, in this theory? Because that then suggests that there's some profound relationship um, between these theories of nature that we really haven't discovered before. Um, so, uh, you know, if this thing really is a new way to think about gravity, there ought to be, there ought to be some way to say I can take anything in this theory and, and map it to gravity and, and hopefully learn a lot about gravity in the in the, in the process. So uh, this question that I've put in red here at the bottom of the slide is really what's motivated my own research papers for basically the last 10 years, at least the ones on, on, on this subject. Um, how general is this double copy and, and can we extend it further? Well, if you didn't know about scattering amplitudes and until you do your quantum field theory course, you, you, you won't really, uh, you might think, uh, well, I know some, uh, some other things in, in gravity theories can I convert them in, in, into things in other theories? And arguably the most famous solution of a, of a gravity theory is a black hole. You know, it's one of the most remarkable things. Uh, remarkable enough that someone has drawn this nice picture on, on Google, which I've stolen. Uh, you know, can we take black holes in gravity theories and say, oh yes, there's something in a, in a gluon theory that is the counterpart of that. If we can do that, it starts to show us that this correspondence is a lot more general than previously thought uh, and really has something deep to say uh, that the fact that these, you know, these theories are related at some kind of deep level. So yes, uh, how to actually work out how to single copy black holes, at least the most common black holes, was actually done by three people, two of which are now at Queen Mary. So I uh, was one of them. Uh, Ricardo Montero, who some of you will know, um, was one of the other ones. So I think he was in Oxford at the time, actually, and I was in Glasgow, but we're now both at, uh, at Queen Mary. Donal O'Connell, a good mate of ours, is in, uh, is in Edinburgh. But the simplest case that you can think of for a black hole uh, is something called the, the Schwarzschild black hole. Uh, and you can think of that as basically being like a point mass. If you were to put a point mass uh, at the origin, say, and you were to say, I want to solve the equation of general relativity for that mass just sitting there, you would get the simplest type of black hole, which is spherically symmetric, static, and we call it the Schwarzschild black hole. Uh, and yeah, so it has what we call a singularity in the, in the middle of it, uh, something called a horizon, where if you fall into the horizon, you can't get out again, uh, and so on. Uh, now, it turns out that the single copy of this object, so in other words, the object living in a gauge theory that copies to the black hole, um, how you get there is not simple, but the result itself is quite simple. Uh, and it turns out to just be a point charge sitting at the origin. So in a yang mills theory, this would be a colour charge, but we can just think about this as being an electromagnetism. So imagine you just have a point charged object sitting at the origin. Um, what the double copy will do is it'll turn that into a black hole uh, and it'll convert the charge into mass. Now, when you think about what happened for amplitudes, 
what happened there is that you took away the color or the charge information in the in the gauge theory and you replaced it with kinematics so that seems like momenta energy mass and, and, and so on exactly the same thing is going on uh, on here you're taking away the charge and you're replacing it with mass so that uh, already tells us that this procedure is kind of like what's happening for amplitudes just in a, a, a different context uh, and indeed this is something that my project students this year have, uh, have been looking at in detail uh, and it's been very nice for me to see them uh, um, explain how, how all that works uh, well the next simplest uh, kind of black hole uh, is something called a Kerr black hole so that's where you have a rotating disk of mass now in fact most of the black holes that are in the universe actually maybe not quite um because they could be charged as well uh but you know if a load of stuff falls into a black hole there's going to be some sort of slight asymmetry in how it falls in so almost all the black holes in nature will be rotating or, or, or spinning black holes now they may also be charged as well which this one isn't uh, but they will certainly be, be rotating uh, we also figured out that you could take the single copy of that um, kind of black hole and that turns out to give you a rotating disk of charge so that's a nice cross check uh, on, on the results if we know that the single copy is turning mass into charge if you have a rotating disk of mass which gives you a, a rotating black hole in gravity you should get a rotating disk of charge in the, in the gauge theory, and indeed you do. Now, we even did things like plot the electrical magnetic fields of the single copy of the curved black hole. Uh, what we find, if you zoom out, this, by the way, is the disk sitting kind of sideways on, is you find that this thing looks like a bar magnet. Um, now, because I haven't studied that kind of electromagnetism for years, I've forgotten why, um, but as I've just been teaching my first years, actually, if you have a coil of, uh, or a little loop of, of, of wire, uh, the field of that, I mean, that looks like a little magnetic dipole. So you basically get what looks like a bar magnet field, uh, which is itself a, a, a dipole field. So, you know, it makes perfect sense, actually, that if you were to take a black hole and take its inverse double copy or its single copy, uh, you will get something that looks like a bar magnet at, at large distances. So there's a lot of sort of nice physics popping out of this rather highfalutin stuff. Yes, so that's some of the um, just basic ideas about how you can extend the double copy. It certainly extends to, to classical solutions. Um, what has been going on in, in recent years? Well, I thought I'd tell you specifically, first of all, about what's been going on at Queen Mary. Uh, and then a little bit more uh, uh, generally. Uh, so I hope I haven't missed any of my colleagues out, but these are some of the things uh, that have been going on. First of all, we've been finding new solutions of this bi-adjoint scalar theory. Remember I said that was a very mysterious theory. If we want to extend the double copy further, we might want to find new types of solution of that bi-adjoint scalar theory and then see if we can match them up in, in, in these double copy relationships and extend them further. So with my PhD student Nadia um, uh, Badget Abbas, and another student, Ricardo Stark we've uh, uh, we've been doing that. Uh, another thing you can do is just find new ways to copy classical solutions. Um, so we don't know how to do arbitrary classical solutions exactly. And we're always looking for new ways of extending the double copy. So Ricardo Montero and Sylvia and Naji have been have been looking at that. Another thing you can do is is say, well, if we don't know how to do arbitrary solutions, we can look at um, properties in the different theories and see whether they match up. So we know about certain symmetries that the gravity theory has to have. Uh, and certain symmetries that the um, uh, gauge or electromagnetic theory has to have. And you might say, well, do those match up under the double copy? Because if they do, it's a strong indication that the whole theories, in a sense, should should, should match up. Uh, so uh, Rashid Alawadi has been doing that with, with, with collaborators. Um, you can also show how certain abstract mathematical properties, something called topology, matches up. So if you have a solution of any field theory, you can characterize its overall shape in a way that says, you know, if I move it, stretch it about, does the overall shape sort of stay the same? Now, those overall shape properties, what we call global properties of a solution that are given by the mathematical branch of topology. Uh, I didn't know much about topology before coming to Queen Mary, but I've learned a great deal from Dave Berman and his student, uh, Luigi Alfonsi, uh, and a PhD student of mine, uh, Sam Whiteley, has been working on that and uh, also hoping we understand these, these things. Uh, also, just finding new examples of the double copy. So I've, I've shown you particularly Yang Mills theory and general relativity, there are different types of gravity theory you can write down. There are different types of yang mill and related theories you can, you can write down. Uh, and there have been various people, myself included, just finding new examples of theories and, and showing that they also match up. Uh, and then finally, starting to explore practical applications of this double copy idea. Uh, now, I'm now going to link back to something I, I talked about earlier in the talk, which is that one of the main practical applications is actually um, gravitational waves. So uh, why should that be? Um, well, First of all, what do those gravitational wave experiments do? Uh, they basically detect colliding black holes. So if you think about it, you have to have something very, very heavy 
moving about very fast <laughs> to, to sort of generate gravitational waves. Gravitational wa or at least generating gravitational waves that you would see. Gravitational waves are very, very weak in general. So you need bloody massive objects uh, doing something really quite spectacular in order to be able to see them giving off gravitational waves. Now, one of the most extreme things you can think about is if you had a pair of black holes, which themselves are very, very large, heavy objects, kind of rotating around each other, spiraling in, uh, merging together, because that's what black holes will do, uh, and, and, and so on. So that is called a black hole in spiral or merger process. Uh, and all of the gravitational wave signals that have been observed have come, we think, from such processes. They could be neutron stars as well as black holes, but this is basically the kind of thing that these experiments are measuring. So there are three phases of any such process. The first is what we call the in-spiral phase, which is just where these things are orbiting around each other. Because when they're orbiting around, they radiate away energy in the form of gravitational waves, they'll gradually spiral into each other, and then eventually the black holes will overlap and they will merge together. So that's called the merger bit of the, of the black hole merger. Uh, and then finally, you're going to get something that's kind of been flung together uh, and is going to kind of wobble like this and then gradually relax and, and calm down. So that wobbling bit, where it's still giving off some gravitational waves, is called the ring down process. And the signal that these experimentalists observe is, is sort of this little chirping thing uh, uh, like this. So basically, what experimenters need um, to get the most out of those experiments is very precise predictions for this in spiral phase. Now, you can also calculate precise predictions for this. This bit of the process is usually calculated numerically with supercomputers or something. Um, but in order to reduce the effort that the computers have to do, if you get more precise results here, uh, then it means you can get much more accurate results because you don't have to run the computers for, 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 for quite so long. Now, the point is that, uh, you know, this is not even quantum GR. If you want to work out how these in spiraling black holes work, classical GR is enough. But to get precise predictions in even classical GR for these processes is extraordinarily complicated and with traditional methods uh, can't be extended that, that easily. It is much simpler to take a gauge theory like QCD, take some colour charged particles, which are what these lines are meant to represent, exchanging gluons, which are what these uh, uh, curly lines are meant to represent, uh, and the point is we can calculate that much, much more easily because we saw earlier that the rules for calculating how, how gluons behave are much easier than the rules for how uh, uh, gravitons behave. Uh, and then you can use this double copy idea to basically just convert the results from the gluon theory to gravity results. And what you get then is a very, very efficient practical tool for calculating new results in classical GR, which are then useful for gravitational wave experiments. So that has been happening over, over the last few years. And indeed, I think there's now at least three examples of things that uh, GR people didn't know that have been calculated for the first time uh, from a gauge theory and then ported to gravity using the, the double copy. So as well as you know, kind of giving us conceptual insights into gravity, it's also a great practical use for, um, uh, uh, for making the calculations easier. Now, one question I have about this actually is that there was also this third phase, the ring down phase. Now, you can also look at that analytically in principle. Uh, so there was some conference I went to where uh, there was a, a, an expert from Brazil, actually, and she was telling me, um, you know, that, that she works for this ring down phase. And actually, there's a lot of very nice physics there. Uh, and I wonder whether the double copy can also help tell us about the, uh, the ring down phase. So in other words, could you have something, a system in a gauge theory that looks like a, a, a wobbling and relaxing black hole and then somehow convert those results into, into gravity results? Now, as far as I know, nobody has looked at that, but I think it's a possibility. And I think it'd be quite interesting if, if someone did. Um, you know, that someone might be me <laughs> if I get time to do it. But ideally, I, I, I would work with someone that knows a bit more about it. But, you know, in case anyone knows about it here, then, uh, then do let me know. OK, so that's the double copy at Queen Mary. Um, but actually, the double copy is getting very, very popular around the whole world. So in recent years, global interest in the double copy has significantly increased. A large part of that is the fact that gravitational waves have been discovered. So there's a real practical impetus for, for um, uh, using the double copy for something. Uh, but there's even an international conference every year de devoted to the to the topic. So actually, I was one of the organisers of the first conference, which we just called QCD Meets Gravity. That was in Edinburgh some, some years ago. But it's since become an annual thing that kind of different universities organise every year. And it's kind of moved around the world. It was in Los Angeles for a few years. Then it was in Sweden, I, th I think, for one year and, and, and so on. Um, and what has happened over the years is that conference has grown and grown and grown. So the um, latest incarnation, which was in December, last year was online for obvious reasons because of the times we're living through but it had over 250 participants from 23 countries uh, so you know it's really a very 
popular research topic around the world, this. What I would also say, though, um, just to kind of, you know, um, blow the trumpet for Queen Mary, is that uh, Queen Mary really is a leader in this. So uh, of that last conference, 10% of the speakers were actually from Queen Mary. Uh, so there were four speakers from Queen Mary. There were two other speakers, one of whom was, was my former student and a person who was coming to Queen Mary. So, uh, so then the number increases even more. So uh, Queen Mary is really having an influence on this on this on this field of research, which is, uh, uh, you know, I'm very proud of the university that I that I, that I work at. Um, so I thought I'd point that out. Uh, but it's a nice field anyway because it brings together lots of different types of physicists. Uh, and one of the things I've always liked and seen as the fun of being a, a theoretical physicist is that you should be able to work on very different areas. And part of the fun of theoretical physics is can you make different areas of physics actually look the same if you use the right language? And of course, that's what the, the double copy does. So I've noticed at these conferences that you have now astronomers and cosmologists, uh, particle physicists who traditionally have had a very different education, uh, and even pure mathematicians who just are very good at um, doing the maths that goes into these these um, uh, scattering amplitude calculations. And you know, there's links between those calculations and number theory and, and, and other uh, nice branches of, of mathematics. So it's really quite an interdisciplinary area where whatever kind of degree program some, someone's come from, um, they have something to bring to the table. And I, I think that's a very nice aspect of this research area as well. So yes, uh, there are many people working at Queen Mary. By putting pictures of them on this page, I run the risk of having forgotten someone. It's also slightly ambiguous from someone's papers whether they're working on the double copy or not. But I essentially put as many of the main players in our group at the moment as fit on the slide. Uh, some of you may know some of these or, or, or not. That's Rashid, who some of you may know, who I mentioned earlier. That's Nadia, my, my student. Dave Berman, who, who was a lecturer. That's Eric Chacon, Ricardo Montero, Sam Whiteley, my student. A terrible picture of me. Uh, David Vega, another student. Ricardo Stark Machao and Sylvia Nagy, who is one of our, our postdocs. Now, of course, in traditional times, I would say well, you're welcome to come to the sixth floor and ask us any questions anytime you like. You can't quite do that at the moment. Uh, but if you ever have any questions on what we work on and, and, and things, do send us an email. We love talking about this stuff. Uh, you know, it's, it's why we get up in the morning to do our physics kind of thing. So, um, you know, just always ask if you're interested and also about how you can get involved. Now, of course, you can get involved in this stuff if you want to. One of the first ways or main ways that you would do that as a student is you can choose projects in your third and fourth year. Those projects involve working with a member of staff on some research type topic in topics like this, which are a little bit advanced. You know, you won't have done quantum field theory yet in the in the third year, for example, but it's always possible usually to choose some aspect of the subject so you can get a little taste of what that's like uh, and actually look at some of the research papers uh, even in the uh, uh, in the third year. So, yeah, do look out for project topics if you're interested in, in, in this when you come to choose products in your um, third and fourth years. And you can also, of course, apply for a, for a PhD place. So we tend to have one or two PhD places a year, sometimes more. Uh, and, you know, those will be advertised uh, on our group web page. Uh, now, if anyone has any questions about, you know, that process uh, near the time, then again, just uh, just let us know. Well, so that's a bit about the double copy and how kind of globally interesting it is. It's even got into popular culture. Uh, so as many of you will know, there's this uh, quite funny um, uh, program called the Big Bang Theory, which also is full of caricatures. So, you know, not, not everybody likes it. Uh, but uh, yeah, there, there was a, a, a character on that who was a, a kind of famously introverted uh, physicist. Uh, and there is an episode in which he decides to sit in the street and calculate properties of a theory called N is H supergravity. And you may not have known if you've seen that episode that what's on the um, board behind him uh, is indeed some calculations using the double copy to get scattering amplitudes in N is H supergravity. Now, uh, if anyone wants to know how that ended up in there, I probably know how, <laughs> so I could explain that. But anyway, if it's good enough for, for Sheldon Cooper, it's, uh, it's good enough for us. So yes, I've gone on long enough, I think. Let me conclude. Uh, the double copy is a new relationship between theories like QCD and gravity. It's only been around for 10 years or so. Um, it strongly suggests our traditional theories need to be rewritten. At least um, many different areas of physics seem to be very similar to each other, if we think about them in the right way. Uh, it might help us to finally understand quantum gravity, or at least get some new results in, in, in those theories. Uh, and even if it doesn't, the double copy could revolutionise practical calculations in, in astrophysics. Um, so, you know, that's a huge area going, going on um, at the moment. Uh, so, yeah, it's recently discovered. It's a highly active research area. Those of you that fancy research careers yourself, this is a fairly young field to get into. So, um, you know, there's lots of exciting stuff going on for those of you that would want to uh, get involved. Um, I thought, uh, uh, as I, you know, I'm giving a talk to, to, to future researchers, uh, that I would have some open questions. So, um, what I never do in these talks is actually go back five years down the line and see if I managed to answer any of them. Uh, but yeah, these are just the questions that came to my mind when I was preparing the talk uh, uh, yesterday. Um, first of all, where does the double copy ultimately come from? We have partial explanations for that, but not complete explanations for that. 
if it really is some profound new property of field theories, answering that question should tell us the right language that we have to write those field theories in order to make these relationships clear. Uh, can it be extended to any solution or quantum solution of gauge theory and or gravity? There are major unsolved problems in both gauge theories and gravity theories uh, that understanding the double copy more could shed light on. Um, it seems that uh, different theories are related. So I gave you three types of theory, bijoint scalar theory, gauge theory and gravity. Actually, we know much more than that now. There's a whole web of theories that are all interrelated by these kind of copying um, uh, uh, relationships. There was even a paper last year looking at fluid mechanics uh, and showing that that could be put in a double copy kind of framework. Um, what seems to be missing is an understanding of which theories are copyable into which other theories and why. Is there a special set of theories that's picked out by the fact that they can be copied into other theories? And is that special set of theories the only ones that can occur in nature or not? Uh, you know, these are basic questions you might ask. We don't know the answers, you know, no, nobody knows. Uh, but, you know, they could be explored. Um, how can the double copy be used for astrophysics? Gravitational waves is one example. Are there other examples like communication satellites and, and, and that sort of thing? Can it be used for cosmology? Um, uh, looking at, say, fluctuations in the microwave background that, that, that we measure, the kind of echo of the Big Bang. Could the double copy help there? Um, you know, there are some indications that it could. Uh, also, can it be used in, in other fields? So I've been looking at some papers recently in condensed matter physics and optics. Uh, I've even been invited to write a review article on the double copy for an optics journal. And I think there are some kind of weird lab based experiments you can do that actually would, would probe the double copy. So, so that's quite interesting. So, yes, my, my um, question to you is, can you answer these or indeed think of anything else uh, interesting uh, uh, that could be done? Um, but with that, I shall end. And thanks for listening. Well, thank you very much. Um, you've done a very good uh, job of talking because I had, a, I had a list of questions written down uh, to ask you in case no one else came up with questions and you answered them all. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is wonderful. Have, have you um, answered these? That's, that would be my question. <laughs> sorry, what? I was going to say, have you answered these questions as the talk's gone on? Because I'd love to know the answers. <laughs> I, I, I think I would, uh, I'd get a scholarship if I had. Unfortunately, <laughs> no. Unfortunately, I haven't. Um, OK, so thank you very much for talking. Um, if anyone has questions, and I know it can be sometimes difficult to think of them, someone has a question, brilliant, because I was really struggling since you've gone through all of mine. Uh, if we were to apply for a third year project in your group, what would be a good place to start for some proficiency in quantum field theory? Um, yeah, that's yeah. a good question for me to answer um, in the sense that for, for me personally, when I'm doing third year projects, I tend to avoid the more QFT based bits of it because otherwise you would spend most of the project just learning QFT and then you wouldn't get a chance to actually do much with it. So I, I tend to focus on the on the classical solution bit of the double copy. But then having said that, that's largely because my own research papers have, have focused on that. Um, what I would say a project should normally do is if you had to learn QFT, it would do it as part of the project. Um, and um, yeah, I'm trying to think of good books that would be the first book to learn QFT from. Um, I mean, there are, there are many, many textbooks on, on QFT. Um, is there one that I can really recommend for Yes, I'm just looking at my shelf because I'm in my office. But I, I think I would, I would have to think more carefully to, to really answer that that, 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 that question because I would have to look at some books and think which are the most suitable when you're first starting out. What you could also do is look at course notes on QFT on the web, actually. Uh, there are some very good notes from David Tong on his web page. Uh, also, you may be able to get some course notes from higher years from Queen Mary mm -hmm. and, and so on. Um, and just have a little look at that. The trouble with, with, with things like that, I just remember when I was a student, you really want to learn those, those highfalutin theories. But it's also very important to learn the theories that you're meant to be working on in the third year as well. Yep. Because you need that stuff to understand QFT. And you can't really seriously approach QFT until you've done enough quantum mechanics. And trying to do so before you've learned the quantum mechanics can actually affect your confidence uh, and, and, and actually harm you rather than sort of, um, you know, there's a certain amount you have to know before you do QFT. So I'm not sure I've answered your question, I'm afraid. I would say I'm perfectly willing to help and suggest and chat, but... Um, I think if, if I could give a slight answer to that, yeah, in sure. your third year, you will study, obviously, lots of quantum mechanics if you choose those modules. And if you do elementary particle physics, you do actually touch on QCD and QFT and QED as well uh, quite a lot. 
So that might help you at least there. But also when it comes to, since I'm doing a project with, with Chris, uh, I think the most important thing, at least in the project I'm doing, was general relativity. Like if, if you if I le learn how to uh, use um, gen uh, Einstein summation convention, uh, the various symbol con conventions, etc., uh, and also matrices. Um, if you can do all of that, that's definitely a major step in the right direction. Um, right, second question. I actually thought about this, so thank you uh, for asking. Uh, yeah, so Amani is asking, yeah, what sort of um, condensed matter experiments are applicable to the double copy? Yeah, I, I need to be able to answer that myself, because as I say, I've been invited to write this review article uh, for, for the double copy for, 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 for optics. But there was a paper in um, Nature Communications or something a couple of years ago I can't remember how I came across this paper, but it was basically people talking about the double copy without realising they were doing it. Uh, and they were saying that you could take pairs of photons uh, and entangle them. So do you know what I, I mean by, by entangling photons? If you have two spin states of, of, of photons, you can either put them so that the spins are pointing the same way or one is pointing one way, one the other way, and, and, and so on. And you can make what we call entangled states where the, the, the spin of one if you measure the spin of one photon, it would automatically tell you the spin of the other one. Um, and there's a way of entangling photons so that you can basically construct the polarization states that a graviton would have. So this paper was arguing that there is an experimental way in which you could simulate gravitons by entangling together quantum photons in a, in, in, in a certain way. And what they did in that paper was very interesting. They said, um, uh, we've got these two polarization states of the of the photon. So if you combine them two photons together, you end up with four polarization states. But we know that the graviton only has two polarization states, as it turns out it does for those of you that have studied these things. So we have to throw two of the polarization states away. Well, what they didn't realize is that they've made something called the axion and something called the dilaton, uh, which the double copy says should be there. <laughs> so there, there is some interesting work out there about some possible experiments that could be done where the authors don't know they're talking about the double copy, but I do, and I'd like to kind of make 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 the link. So that's one thing that could be done. Another thing is that we don't know much about the double copy in curved backgrounds. So you can define the graviton around flat space, but you can also define a graviton around a curved space, where you're sort of treating then some of the space in a quantum way and some of the space in a in a in a classical way. So what we call semi-classical gravity, and that's like how we look at fluctuations in the early universe and so on, where it's not flat space. But you still have little fluctuations around a, around a larger background. I think if you manage to make those entangled photon pairs behave like gravitons, you could put them through a fancy type of material called a metamaterial, and you could use that to simulate the effect of, effect of a curved background. So that's rather speculative, but I think there are lab-based experiments you could do that would simulate areas of the double copy that we don't know much about. Uh, now, there was even some people at Imperial that I was talking with at some point to try and get some money to look at this. We didn't manage to get the money, but um, uh, I'm going to get back in touch with them, I think, when I've written this review article and say, look, are there some ideas that we could look at here? Because, um, you know, one of the things that's always struck me is that in London, we've got all these universities, we should work together a bit more. Um, having said that, there's a pandemic going on, but, you know, when that's, <laughs> when that's done, we can get back to this maybe. So, uh, Kamani, does that answer your question? I mean, there may well be other things that I haven't thought of there. But... Ah, yes, so sorry, I was just in your, your, your other comment, which is that you know that King's College is working on superfluids for ADS CFT. That may well be a similar idea that they, they're using that to simulate ADS CFT. Um, some people have asked me before, is ADS CFT related to the double copy? So, for those that don't know what ADS CFT is, that's another relationship between a gauge theory and uh, a gravity theory in higher dimensions. Um, so, it is not quite the double copy because the double copy is a relationship between theories in the same number of dimensions. However, there must be some sort of weird loop you can do in the space of theoretical ideas that takes you from a, a gauge theory to a gravity theory to a different gravity theory to, you know, whatever. And, uh, and there's something to look at there, but I, I, I don't know um, whether anyone's done it, but it's a question I get a lot, actually. OK, so there's another question. Hey, thanks for the talk. You mentioned knowing topology is useful, but from my understanding, I don't think the physics department teach topology, but the mass department does. Do you recommend doing that over cosmology if one is more interested in QFT or strings? I would say um, no there, actually, simply because um, what happens in research is that if you haven't covered something in your degree, you can just pick it up as you need it. So, you know, I, I have learned topology by writing papers that feature topology. 
you know, I've worked with people that do know more about topology. I have then gone away and learned about it. The learning about it has been with a certain goal in mind, which is I want to see if I can use it for the double copy. So, you know, as I'm learning topology, I'm constantly thinking, can I use it for, for, for the aspect of the double copy? That's very different from doing it in a lecture course where you wouldn't necessarily be, be focusing on, on, on what you wanted to, to, to use it for. Now, the other thing is that um, cosmology is um, a lot more kind of general and useful thing to know about at that stage than quite a specific ma mathematical thing. So I would say that um, the aspects of topology that you need for particle physics, you would tend to cover in a later strings course or QFT course anyway, or, or in your research career. And that actually cosmology might be more interesting to do at an earlier stage, because that's a kind of more general purpose thing. Uh, and the topology would be a bit more of a specialist thing. Now, I mean, that's an opinion, so um, feel free to disagree with it. But I, I don't know if that makes any sense to you. I can recommend a good book on topology. It is called to Topology and Geometry for Physicists, and it is by Nash and Siddhartha Sen. Uh, and it's an old book, but it's cheap. It's about 12 quid. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a technical book. But it is quite a nice read, actually, and it's a book that I find I get off the shelf a lot of times if I want to look something up. Right. So again, as usual, um, interrupt me if any of you have questions that you haven't put in yet. But otherwise, I'm going to say thank you, uh, Dr. Chris White, uh, for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, quick news as to what's coming in the future. Uh, currently, I have nothing next Wednesday. I have been trying so hard to get someone to talk next Wednesday. But um, apparently the 14th of April is a very, very busy day. Uh, for at least seven academics. Um, so there we go. However, the week after that, we have, uh, hype in the chat please, uh, a talk from Professor Thomas Bohr, the grandson of Professor Neil Spohr, son of, I think it's Arga Bohr, both of whom were Nobel Prize winners uh, of their generations. And he'll be talking uh, about his father and his grandfather, and about his research into uh, fluid dynamics and chaos theory. And he'll be calling in from Copenhagen, I believe. So once again, thank you, Dr. Chris White. That was very interesting. Um, I'm going to stop the record because I always forget.